Geography and food are inextricably connected. Before Farm to Table came to popular prominence, charging 20 bucks for a local pea shoot served alongside a charred spring onion, people actually had to just eat the ingredients that grew around them. From a geographical standpoint, one might be surprised to learn about Nikkei cuisine, a Peruvian and Japanese crossover that brings together two countries over 9,000 miles apart. But from a migratory perspective, this culinary invention is entirely sensible. Japanese farmers began immigrating to Peru at the end of the 19th century to work as contract laborers on coastal plantations. Craving a taste of home, they were forced to make do with what they had, applying Japanese culinary techniques to Peruvian ingredients, some of which Peruvian natives didn't yet utilize, such as eel and octopus. At Sensacana, chef Mina Newman, drawing from her Peruvian roots, collaborated with Osaka native Taku Nagai to bring the riches of Nikkei cuisine to a larger audience. Nikkei cuisine is the marriage of Japanese and Peruvian cultures. It's said that they've come in two waves. Mm -hmm. The one was the late 1800s, and then again in like 1920s, there were businessmen that said, let's bring labor force from Japan. As those labor contracts expired, some of them stayed and they made businesses here, they established their homes here, some of them went back. The ones that stayed grew the culture more and more. These people live in Peru, make their food the way they wanted to make it, and they use the ingredients that Peru has to offer. Just some of the research I've done, it seems like the relationship between those two cultures was very fraught. Yes, uh, for yeah, yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, you have examples of, like, I believe Peru is the first Latin American country to allow Japanese immigration. Right. There is a Japanese Peruvian president, president from, mm -hmm. what, 1990 to 2000. Right. Uh, but then you also had an earthquake in which there was looting involved and there was a, a three-day race riot um, yeah. in 1940 or something. Right, right. So I'm interested in when did, they, when did these people the... learn from each other? You put a small diaspora into such a homogenous culture. Sure. I feel like How the does Peruvians that become integrated? took to the Japanese style more so later than the Japanese's necessity of adapting to where they were brought to. Mm -hmm. Just even eating all the fish the coastal Peru has to offer was something new to Peruvians. You know, they wouldn't eat eel in the past, they wouldn't eat octopus in the past. The Japanese came and treat the fish very differently. Mm -hmm. There is no Peruvian ceviche now without it having Japanese influence. None mm -hmm. in Peru. This is a uh, ceviche clásico. It's very much what people think of. It's a white corvina fish. It's mixed with fresh lime juice, ají limo, which is a chili pepper from Peru. Cilantro is added at the end. And then we put a leche de tigre, which is a whole separate sauce, more or less the secret ingredient. And then we pour that over the fish. And that's where we add dashi. The introduction of the dashi that brings the umami to the dish, mm -hmm. which is to Peruvians, that doesn't exist. Right. Just the fact that if it tastes delicious, well, it tastes delicious. Doesn't, right. There's only the four cents, it's not the mm -hmm. fifth. Mm -hmm. This is one of the most beautiful ceviches I've ever seen. Thank you. I've never seen this gigantic <laughs> corn yes. before. Yes, it's similar to a hominy. One thing that really struck me in the kitchen was that there were surprisingly inherent similarities between some Peruvian ingredients and Japanese ingredients. Yes. For instance, I had no idea that Peru had a, a seaweed that was native to it, and yes. uh, that bonito was already there, but it was n never prepared in, in this way. Correct. The usage of all those ingredients is just based on what people know. They didn't just bring this bonito and put it in the soup because it kind of looked good. They used it as their um, the segue to the next part of their lives. Mm -hmm. Now they knew they were going to stay, and they had to adapt to what they had. They would take their seaweed and it would be the Peruvian seaweed because that's what they could get. This is our tuna tiradito with a tozazu, just agua, I call it agua chile, and it has a chili oil around the dish. It's layered with a quick pickle of radish, avocado, cucumbers, and then on top is our yuyo. It looks so beautiful. Thank you. I'm so Thank struck you. by how vibrant all of the colors are on this table. Yeah, it's definitely very Latin America. Just yes. Peru is full of that vibrancy. Yeah. Do you have any 
you mind telling me just a little bit about your family and your background okay. for those who don't know? So my mother is from Chiclayo, Peru, which is the north of Lima. Mm -hmm. And my father was Russian Jewish. Mm -hmm. My mother was very forward with us. We were raised very Latino, speak Spanish at home. Eat, ate all these dishes at home. So much so that my father wanted to retire in Peru. And you never thought of um, a Peruvian Jewish <laughs> No, I never thought of a Peruvian Jewish restaurant. Never. These are cultures, mm -hmm. not fusions. Can you tell me a little bit more about Anticuchos? Anticuchos are like, after you go partying, mm -hmm. you go and you have Anticuchos. There's something about all cultures sharing meat on a stick equals party. Yes, and that yeah. smell of charcoal is always reminiscent mm -hmm. of, it seems like a good time. This is our veal cavhar anticucho. I love the heart. It's just one of my favorites. <laughs> We're all heart. It reminds me of home. I feel like it's yeah. so Peruvian. I yeah. Love it. yeah I, oh, if I go to a restaurant, Peruvian restaurant, I always order that. This is super traditional Peruvian, except our marinade has aji panca, it has miso, a Japanese soy sauce, and little siao. Siao is more of a Chinese style soy sauce. Mm -hmm. When we were growing up, there was always siao, always ginger, of course, always garlic and chili peppers. And so when I started to do this restaurant, I read, did the R&D and I was like, now this all makes sense, why? Because there are dishes that don't have any ginger in it and there are dishes that don't have siao in it. The more I did more research about it and asked my mother and my aunt, my godmother, and they were like, well, that, this is all Japanese and Chinese influence. In Peru, the, the Chinese, they call them chinos, even though they're Japanese. Mm -hmm. That's what they brought to us. And I would say, oh, that all makes a lot of sense because the flavors are like that. It said that when they came over, they brought shoyu in their, in their packages when they yeah. came. And miso, that was another big one that they knew was not going to be available to them in Peru. The sauce really makes it. It's so nice to have that combination. That ginger, those chili peppers, it all works so well together. The use of ginger is another one that doesn't seem to be people think about in Peru. There were also a big immigration of Chinese people that came mm -hmm. that kind of that came mm -hmm. before the Japanese mm -hmm. people. So they brought that ginger, planted it, and that mm -hmm. already grew. And so that was innate to what was already established mm -hmm. in Peru. And so Japanese welcomed that. This is our pork belly wrapped in a Peruvian cheese. Mm -hmm. Is there a lot of cheese in Peru? We love cheese. Uh, as a Korean person, the marriage of pork belly and melted cheese is like right up Oh, my I alley, can imagine so. with the rice cake. Uh, yeah, it is a glorious thing <laughs> that you've made here. It's so good. Yeah. I could eat this forever. So can you tell me a little bit about your relationship with... Uh, Taku. Taku, yes. So Taku and I met here. Mm -hmm and we wanted to work together, mm -hmm. but it just never pans out. And mm -hmm. so then he moved back to Japan and mm -hmm. I called him up and I said, we're gonna do a Japanese restaurant. Mm -hmm. So I brought Taku back from Japan and we went to Peru. We ate out like four meals a day, we went to the market, the fish market, the, all the produce, everywhere, mm -hmm. like where I grew up. And then we came back and we started playing with items. My Peruvian and his, just the Japanese ingredients, so all the different soy sauces that were great learning experience for me as well, um, methods. And for him, you know, working with chili peppers in general just are a little hesitant. And Japanese people are not used to the cilantro flavor. Mm -hmm. That's not in their flavor palette. This dish is our sudado de mariscos. And we use in this one halibut that we've separately pan seared. And then we crisp up aji panca and the shellfish and ginger. And then we deglaze it with yuzu. Whereas some people would have eat this with rice, Japanese eat with noodles. With noodles. Yeah, as a soup. This looks great. In this restaurant, we use four different soy sauces, three different misos, two different yuzu juices. So it's all over the place, and all of that wouldn't have been possible if Taco and I didn't come together mm -hmm. to say this shoyu is better than this one, mm -hmm. or we have to use CL for this dish no matter what. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's a real marriage of two absolutely. people. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, yes, absolutely. And mm -hmm. the same of what the culture is. It's mm -hmm. exactly what Nikkei is, you mm -hmm. know. It is the same collaboration mm -hmm. of these two marriages, these two great, great cultures and cuisines just coming together and forming one. It's the next generation. It's the children of those of the people, the children of the children, children now mm -hmm. who are cooking. Can I ask, what do you think of the word fusion? Oh, I I hate that word. 
the definition of it doesn't seem inherently bad, but it's become such a right. such a lazy connotation. It becomes confusion mm -hmm. when it's just let me take this rambutan and put it with lomo saltado. Let me fry it up because it has this kind of texture. That is a confusion mm -hmm. where people were brought here, made do, made it their own. Mm -hmm. And I always assimilate this to the, the New York bagel. The New York bagel is what the Eastern Europeans made here in New York mm -hmm. because that's the bread that was similar to what they had back home. So you would never call a bagel fusion because it's not. It's more of an adaptation, mm -hmm. right? Because we all adapt and make it our own. And so that's what the Nikkei people did mm -hmm. in Peru. Mm -hmm. They made their adaptation as they grown through years and years and years of what was around in Peru. And they, and they used things that Peruvians wouldn't use. The eel and the fish, the seaweed alone. It was right there and people just thought it was below them to use it. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about this last dish. Oh, this is one of my favorites. And this potato. This is a yellow potato. It's cooked first, and then it's super frozen, and then it's fried again so that it's crispy on the outside and creamy on the inside. We're big okay. starch country. The, the rice and I the potatoes, really yes. This potato has changed me. <laughs> <laughs> Japanese people, because they came from a time of war, uh, were so amazed that they could have so much rice. It was right. a luxury to right, them. Right. What was your interest in approaching this cuisine instead of traditional Peruvian dishes? It, it, this is, it's time. It's time to have another level of Peruvian food. Mm -hmm. We have the Pollo La Brasa, we have the Criollo restaurants, and so I thought now is as good as time as ever. Mm -hmm. you know, now we just have to do things that are different. And so it's nice Indeed. that Peruvian food is finally having their moment in. It's mm -hmm. great to be able to introduce another element of it. It's time for Nikkei to have its audience, its mm -hmm. stage. Mm 